So uh, we're gonna really focus on this session with the Homework Trails Fosters Q&A on uh, focusing on some obedience tips, some obedience training exercises that you can do that really focus in on this idea of helping to develop impulse control in our foster dogs. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, so when we're talking about impulse control behaviors, what does that really mean? Um, what we're really talking about here is most dogs have a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, and that energy can sometimes get a dog into trouble. They're making decisions, um, but those decisions may not be the best decisions based on what we want. Um, you might think about, we've done a session where we talked about leash manners. That's one area where we can see a dog who's like very uh, focused on squirrels or focused on other dogs. And they get so excited that that leads to some level of pulling or even barking um, towards these kinds of distractions. So that's one place where we can focus on building impulse control um, with the idea of kind of getting dogs to understand, and we talked about this, getting dogs to understand that it pays when they give their attention to their handler rather than looking at other things in the environment and letting those um, other stimuli really get them like super hyped up. We can also think about polite greetings kind of falls into this category. The super enthusiastic dog who gets very excited, very aroused when um, there's a visitor who comes to say hello, whether it be outside or in the house. And that dog is just like a jumping bean up and down, up and down, up and down. So, um, you know, instilling mechanisms where that dog understands how to greet someone else. Um, and there's a protocol that we establish around that where they're getting a lot of reinforcement for rather than the up and down, up and down, we're really rewarding four paws on the floor and really kind of enforcing this idea of when you jump, you don't get attention. When you don't jump, you get that attention and also treats and things um, as we're working proactively on these behaviors. So those are a couple of examples. Um, one of the so I'm going to go through a couple of exercises again. I, I encourage you all to use the chat box to type in any questions that you have, any thoughts, any other areas you want me to cover, whether it's related to impulse control stuff or not. Um, I wanted to start out with talking a little bit about management. We've talked, we had a whole session where we talked about enrichment and enrichment toys and the idea that. It's not just about the physical exercise, but also about the mental enrichment that we give these dogs to help them have a nice balanced sense of exhaustion. You know, every dog that we have, um, every dog that's been bred, whether it be um, a mix or not, they have some level of working dog in them. And one of the challenges we have, particularly with dogs who are not being put to work and who are literally just waiting for their owners or their fosters to come come home and hang out with them um, in a pre-COVID situation, um, those dogs are not given, their only job is to wait. And that's not really mental enrichment for them. So this is where investing in puzzle toys, we talked about snuffle mats, we talked about other puzzle toys, the Kong Wobbler, um, the Licky Mats, um, working on doing like find it in the backyard where you're tossing food or treats into the grass, doing find it in the house where you're hiding food in different areas of the room. Those are all really nice mechanisms for mental enrichment to help bring that dog's act mental act activity down and help them be a little bit more balanced. Um, training sessions also fall into that category of mental enrichment. So, and we've talked in the past about the importance of doing you know, short sessions that are um, multiple times a day. So making this very realistic, right? It's very hard sometimes for us to find 30 minutes to train with our dogs. And I think a lot of people feel like it's gotta be like a long session or else it's not worthwhile. The opposite is true. When we do training sessions with our dog, three to five minutes is like the ideal. I wouldn't go longer than five minutes at a time. We know that humans, dogs, other creatures, learn best in short bouts that are repetitive. So I would much rather, if your goal is to tr work with your foster 30 minutes a day, I would much rather see them that be six five minute sessions than one 30 minute chunk of time. And that can be 
immediately before a walk, doing like working on side placement, immediately after a walk, once the dog is tired, doing some, some like the name game and other things that we've talked about in the past. But you know, using those opportunities and building it into the times where you're already interacting with the dog. Um, Drop It is a great one when you're playing with toys to integrate some training on Drop It. And we can talk a little bit more about that. I think we talked about Drop It when we were talking about resource guarding. So I'm not gonna focus that much on, on Drop It, but that's another area where you can really, um, you know, if you're playing with dogs, you can they have the toy in their mouth, you can get a treat right over their nose. They're likely to release the toy, they get the treat, they get the toy back. So all of this can really be incorporated into things you're already doing. Um, rather than kind of thinking about, I need to set aside just additional time that I didn't plan to do um, to work with dogs. The other thing that I want to remind you all is that when we are working, especially if we're doing training sessions, the value of the treat really matters and the environment matters. So um, throughout these series of webinars, we've been really focusing in on the idea of the value of the treat, which is which is basically their payment, it's their motivation. So working with kibble is not going to cut it, right? We really want to focus on these high value treats, think stinky, um, and and generally wet, um, but stinky foods, small bits at a time. This is where you know I use baked chicken all the time, freeze dried treats. Um, yeah, leave it is leave it is absolutely a good training activity. Um, but using different really high value stinky and smelly treats is a really great way to make sure that you're paying your dog appropriately, right? If you don't pay them appropriately, they're going to go on strike. Um, so we want to make sure that we're recognizing their work they're putting in and rewarding them accordingly. Um, and then finally, thinking about your, your environment. Um, I think we tend to be very quick to move to more distracting environments, but when we're working on um, training, especially when we're working on training where, the, where we're using positive reinforcement. And the thing with positive reinforcement is the dog is learning if they can get rewarded for the behavior, for the decisions they're making. So if you decide that you're gonna practice sit in the middle of a busy intersection and your dog is so distracted by that intersection, they can't sit then you can't reward them for making a good decision and they can't learn that that's the choice, that's a good choice to keep making. So it's up to you as the handler to say, well, clearly this environment's too distracting. We're gonna move to a less distracting environment. We're gonna go to the lobby of our apartment building or the hallway or back inside. Or if you're lucky enough to have a backyard, we're gonna continue working in the backyard. So really think about distractions as you're working with your dogs, if there, it's a too much of a distracting environment, it's really up to you to change the environment so that they can be really successful. And I should mention one thing that I see very commonly is this, um, this thought process of, well, yesterday my dog was able to do this behavior in the backyard. Why can't my dog do this today? We're gonna keep working until he gets it right. And it's important to recognize that just like with us, dogs have good days and bad days, and they're more sensitive on certain days, and they're less sensitive on certain days. So if you're finding that you're doing a training session and you're building on something you did yesterday, and they were successful yesterday, but they're not successful today, then rather than trying to re repeat where you, what you're doing, you're still gonna say, okay, today is different, and this is too distracting, so we're gonna go to a less distracting environment. Um, so that's kind of the setup for today. I see Karen is asking, does anyone have suggestions for good high value treats? Um, which I, uh, if folks have suggestions, please write in. Uh, Karen, I'll let you know, and I just mentioned a couple. So um, you know, chicken, baked chicken is a great one. Um, you might also look at, so I use uh, freeze dried foods, Bravo, Pure Bites, and Stewart's all have freeze-dried foods. Um, freeze-dried organ meats tend to be really, really high value for most dogs. Um, there might also be jerky treats out there, other kind of pure treats that you can use that you can cut up. Uh, but my go-tos generally tend to be freeze-dried treats, 
chicken breast, and, and canned dog food is actually a really good one too. So you can get a squeeze tube that you can load canned dog food into and then just give them a little squirt of canned dog food. Generally that tends to be pretty high value for most dogs that I work with. So those are a couple of tips from me. If anybody else has um, more suggestions, please write in. Um, okay. Let's talk about, this is a great question, how do you teach a large dog to sit? Let's take a step back and talk about teaching sit because that can be a really powerful um, behavior to, uh, to integrate immediately into a foster dog's repertoire because if you think about it, sitting is kind of counter to jumping um, and a lot of times when we want a dog to interact nicely with a human, what we want to see is that the dog knows how to sit in the presence of a human and the first step of being able to sit in the presence of a human is just knowing how to sit so let's start with that first um so generally oh my gosh bingo just gave a giant groan i don't know if he is gonna want to work but we're gonna try to do this what do you think my love can you come here thank you try to bribe you maybe you come here? Yeah? Okay. All right, we'll see how, how long Bingo is willing to work with us. So to teach sit, with any cue that you are teaching, first step is always working on a hand signal versus doing body language, or sorry, versus doing a verbal. The reason is that dogs generally are very attuned to body language and changes in body language but they are not for knowing English or German or Spanish or really any kind of verbal communication that humans use. So we can use body language changes, right? This is usually what we use for sit, down, um, and then integrate that later, use that hand signal once they know that hand signal to teach them how to respond to verbal cues. So step one is I really want to emphasize that Y'all should resist the urge to introduce a verbal immediately. I'm gonna just close this line so that it's a little less bright. Okay. So we're gonna focus on body on body language changes with using hand signals. So I like to use the hand signal where you bring a flat palm up to your shoulder. The idea, oh what a good boy. The idea with this is when you're doing this hand signal, especially for a new dog, by pushing forward and up, right, nice, I know you're sitting already, um, that dog should follow with their eyes that hand signal. And as you're doing it, as they're following that hand signal, they're gonna naturally kind of start leaning backwards. So it's a natural progression to get the, their butts to hit the ground. That's the idea with using that hand signal. Um, so what this looks like, you're gonna start out, for a dog that doesn't know sit at all, you're gonna start out using what's called a food war. That means that in that palm, in the, in the palm of your hand, you're gonna put a treat so the dog is very interested in following the, um, the hand as it moves. Can you come here, bud? So I put the treat over Bingo's nose and then I'm gonna push back and up. Yes, mark reward. Go find it. Bingo. Push up. Yes. Obviously, Bingo knows sit very well. Um, but for most dogs, so the key here when you're doing this with a dog who's very new to the sit cue, a lot of people tend to rush the cue and kind of like bump. And that doesn't give the time the dog time to kind of follow that hand signal. So you want to think about your hand being almost a, like a one-inch string that's connecting your hand to the dog's nose and you're kind of moving with the dog, okay? So really try not to move the hand so quickly that the dog just loses the scent of the food in your hand and loses that, this is the guide for the dog, right? So now after two or three times with success, are you not gonna do it? <laughs> Good job. Um, after like two or three times of using a food war and warring them into position, you might try just your hand, no food in it, and see if they're already starting to learn. Bingo. Good boy, yes. 
So we want to, in general, we want to be very quick about getting rid of the food lure, the food in your signaling hand. The reason for that is we want the dog pretty immediately to be able to understand that they will still get food when they do the behavior, but not rely on food being in the hand to do it. We don't want them to learn that the only time I work is when this person has food in their hand. So the sooner you can get rid of the food lure, the better. Now the question that was asked was about how to get a large dog to sit. This is like the universal way to start, whether you're working with a small dog or a large dog, right? So we're gonna just do that hand signal. We're gonna get that sit, yes, buddy. We're gonna mark with our mark word or clicker, click, and then we're gonna give the food. That's how you start. I would recommend when you first start this, one, a couple of things to pay attention to. One, you want to reward immediately when that butt hits the ground. Don't worry about them holding a duration just now. It's really about them just getting the practice in and understanding that this hand signal means their butt needs to go on the ground, okay? Um, so immediately after the butt hits the ground, they get a mark, they get a reward. Um, the other thing is really pay attention. Again, distractions are critical. So when you first start this for the first week, only ask for six, only cue and practice this in your home, at least for the first week. We want to get it, the rule of 80%, we want to make sure that the dog four out of five times or eight out of 10 times, when you cue that hand signal, they're going to respond before we make it any harder. So I generally say a week of practicing in one room and then maybe the kitchen and then maybe a bedroom, right? Throw a window open, but keep practicing inside before you ever try to bring this to a more distracting environment. Look a boy. And I'd say after a couple, uh, maybe after the first day or two, if you're getting success and your dog is 80% is being responsive to the hand signal, then you can think about adding a little more duration. So now I'm gonna cue that sit. One, oh, you're gonna get up. Oh, that was really nice of you. Ready, I'm gonna cue the sit. One, two, yes, and give the reward. So I can add a little more duration onto that sit just by withholding the timeline of marking. So I can count internally in my head, one second, two second, and now I'm gonna mark. And then build from two seconds to three seconds, and then five seconds. And once you have a solid five second sit, then you can start playing with like, with um, changing the duration each time. So maybe it's two seconds, and then maybe it's five seconds, and then maybe it's a second, and then maybe it's five seconds, and then maybe it's seven seconds, and then maybe it's three seconds. So you can start to play with duration when the distraction is low. As you start to move it to a more distracting environment, we start from the beginning. So duration is still immediate when you add that new environment and you build up during, you build up again from there. So one of the critical things to think about when you're doing any kind of behavior, there are the three Ds of training, distraction, duration, and distance. If one of those gets harder, the other two get easier. That's the golden rule, okay? So if I add distractions by changing the environment and moving outside, then my duration is going back to zero. And I'm working at a close distance. Okay. So that's how I would start working with a sit. Let me come back and see what some of the uh, comments are, just so I can make sure that we're addressing any questions. So, um, okay. Okay, and we should probably maybe talk offline about your comment um, about uh, your foster dog. So let's um, maybe if you want to hold on after this, um, I might try to end a couple minutes early and we can talk or we can connect via email. Um, and then let's see.
Okay. Actually, Karen just, oh, yep, great. Karen just answered the question. Fantastic. So yeah, if you, let's just talk about this a little bit, um, just in case there are others who are having challenges with dogs being around other dogs. So Anne writes that my dog is amazing with people, but tends to growl with new dogs until she becomes comfortable. Uh, the other day, my friend came over with her lab and her dog did not react well. We'll just say that. Um, so here's the thing, when you have dogs that are exhibiting, um, who are growling at other dogs, who are avoiding other dogs, who are showing very clear signs that they're not comfortable with other dogs, even if that is happening, not with every dog, if that's happening just selectively, I would still encourage you all, first I would encourage you if they're your foster dogs to make sure that um, you're engaging your uh, your adoption counselor on this so that they're aware that the behaviors are happening. But um, beyond that, I always, so growling, barking, snapping, these are all behaviors where dogs are communicating to other dogs and often those communications can be, I'm not comfortable, please stay away. Um, sometimes you know, there's also play barking and growling and things like that. So there are some differences that um, we can talk about some other time, but in this situation, I think, Anne, it sounds like you're, uh, you acknowledge and recognize that she's not comfortable and is getting used to the other dog. So in this instance, when you see a dog that is showing signs, even if it's not around every dog, but around some dogs, I would encourage you to assume that there's some anxiety with that dog around any other dog. And you're gonna do, uh, you're basically going to, just as we talked about with reactive dogs in that session, you really want to make sure that you're keeping that dog at a distance that they feel comfortable. And you can look at, you can watch their body language and watch what they're telling you through some of their um, appeasing signals to see where that is. So cue number one, if the dog is completely avoiding eye contact and is like, mm, I don't see that thing over there, you're too close. So take some distance, right? If your dog is showing more, um, so there are signs of appeasement, things like panting, increased rate of panting, increased yawning, um, tension in the body is a really great indicator, staring, or even what's called whale eye, when you see the whites of their eyes, then their pupils get pretty big and dilated. Those are all ways to see some concern that's happening in your dog. You see those signs, you're taking some distance and you're certainly not closing the gap, right? So distance to where they're comfortable. And then we're gonna go to a classical conditioning exercise where now we're feeding. If you can walk in parallel with that dog while feeding. Um, if you can get the dog who's concerned to do some responses to cues or you know, capturing loose leash, things like that, that's also great. The more you can work the dog side by side at a distance, the more they can build up a comfort in being in proximity to one another, but you certainly don't want to rush them coming together. It might take multiple sessions to get them to a point where they're comfortable being in, in a close proximity to one another before you ever even think about taking them off leash. So Karen, great answer. Um, also, Karen, great answer, answer on how to um, separate if they get too close and go into a fight. Um, what is my opinion on muzzle use? Um, yeah, so Karen is exactly right. You would want to do muzzle training if you want to use a muzzle. Um, I'm all for muzzles as a tool for, um, as, a, as an added tool in your toolbox. So um, for those of you interested in learning more about muzzles, there's a great website called The Muzzle Up Project. Um, and they have a series of videos that teach you how to desensitize muzzles to a dog. Um, there's this horrible stigma, I think, about wearing muzzles. And I, it's been like my mission and it's the mission of The Muzzle Up Project to break that stigma. A muzzle doesn't necessarily mean that your dog is awful and aggressive and shouldn't be in public. A muzzle is meant to be an extra added precaution. So for example, with Bingo, who, who is with me and who I've been working, you know, since he's been with me, I've been working with him on his interactions with strangers. 
I will use a muzzle on him and he is muzzle trained. I will use that. Um, so generally what I start out with is he's behind a gate and, some, and a stranger is tossing him treats and he has no access to that stranger. But as I decide that he's getting more comfortable with that stranger and I want him to be on the other side, on the same side of the fence as that stranger, I might decide to put the muzzle on him just to make sure that if he gets overwhelmed and tries to bite, there's a barrier that allows him, that keeps him from actually making contact. So what I don't want to encourage is the muzzle as this like insurance factor that allows a, you to throw a dog into a situation that you know they're not gonna be comfortable with. A muzzle is really meant to be an insurance policy for situations that you are 99.9% .9 confident the dog is ready for it, but just because that 0.1% we're not sure of, we're gonna have the muzzle as an added safety factor. If you're not at that level of confidence, then you don't, you're not putting the dog in that situation. Okay, so that's, that's my, my spiel on muzzles. Okay, um, so we just went through sit. Maybe we should now transition to just teaching sit to a down and a down behavior so folks can start to work on that. Now, I am a huge fan of go to mats and transitioning dogs so that they understand their, uh, that they have a safe space to go which is their mat, and really working on down on a mat. So with Bingo, I have this mat. That he actually knows the cue go to mat, and I can tell it to him, and he will come lay on his mat. But you can also start by just working on learning down on the mat and that can really help the dog to start understanding how to do how to do it down and actually i'm gonna go this way thanks can you come here yeah good boy oh so exciting you know so i asked for the sit yes <laughs> again bigger does go to mat really well so he's just defaulting to his go to mat cue which is lovely but not helpful for the purposes of demonstrations. Can you come back up here? Oops. I know, bud. I know you're tired. What a champ. Can you go get that? Okay, I might do this really quickly. So I ask for a sit, and then the down cue is taking a, lowering it down is taking a piece of food, turning your palm flat to the ground, and then dropping your hand slowly to the ground. Can you go come? So here, and now again, there's a string attached to his nose and my hand. I need you to come all the way. Yes, buddy. He's very confused because this is like very back to kindergarten for him. So the idea here is again, we're dropping our hand, but we're not doing it so quickly that the dog's nose pulls away from the food lure in our signaling hand, good boy. So nice and slow using a food lure to start out with. Can you go find it? On this bit. Just sit. And down. Good boy. Yeah. Right? So hand, again, Bingo's very well versed at this, so he's doing it very quickly. Um, but that's the idea with down. You might, again, try, you know, three to five times with a food lure, and then try without the food lure, dropping your hand to the ground. Hey. Thanks. This can be a really challenging behavior, particularly for small dogs. There's a, I've, I've seen a lot of instances where small dogs are very difficult, very challenged to get this behavior. One thing I want to just mention, um, one troubleshooting way you can do this is for a smaller dog, you can sit on the ground and if what I just demonstrated isn't working, you can use your leg, your bridge, like create a bridge with your leg and you can take a treat on the side where the dog is where bingo is and i would just lure the dog through my leg to start getting them to practice going down the idea is as they come down they need to drop their chest to follow the treat through my leg 
So that's one way to just get them to practice the behavior if you're having challenges with a small dog um, in getting them down. Obviously, this isn't gonna work with a big dog um, unless you have like giant legs. So it's a great mechanism for a small dog, not terribly useful for a larger dog. With a larger dog, if you are running into challenges, what you can do is break down the behavior so that instead of waiting for the dog to go fully down like Bingo is here, you might drop your hand and as soon as if they drop their head, you might reward that. If they drop their head and chest, you reward that and eventually head, chest, butt, you reward that. So you break up the down behavior, recognizing that usually there's a sequence that happens, the head drops, the chest drops, the butt drops. And you can capture those as three independent behaviors and kind of build to rewarding that full body down. I know, buddy. I know, buddy. So that is how you would work on doing the down. Um, and again, just like with the sit, you're going to want to um, really focus in on the hand signal for, I would say, at least two, probably three weeks, or two, two weeks, two to three weeks, get the hand signal really solid before you ever think of introducing the verbal. If you, if you introduce the verbal, then what you're going to do when you get to that point is say the verbal, the cue first, down and then follow it with the hand signal. So what you're basically doing is using the signal they know and telling them that this sound coming out of my mouth down means this thing. This is classical conditioning, right? Building an association, down means this. Sit means this. But we wanna make sure that, that's why we have to make sure that the hand signal is really, really well um, understood before we ever introduce the verbal. And if we introduce the verbal, I have, there are a lot of folks out there that will do this, sit. And the problem with that is if you say it and you do it, the dog is gonna respond to what they know. So they're not hearing the sound, they're just responding to the hand signal, which is why it's very important that you do sit and then follow with the hand signal, okay? Um, any recommendations for muzzle types? So um, I know a lot of folks use, uh, what's, where is this? Barkerville, I think. I think this is Barkerville. Um, this one is, yeah, or oh, sorry, Baskerville. Baskerville is one like pretty, um, very affordable um, and common brand to use to kind of um, start out with. And then you might decide if this doesn't work for you and you want to kind of get the Cadillac of, of muzzles. There are other muzzles out there. The major Cadillac out there is um, Boomus. It's a German company. Um, they are custom made to fit your dog and your dog's muzzle. That's what this is. They are not in it. They're, they're pretty expensive. Um, so this is an investment. Um, but it is something, you know, I would recommend starting with the, the Baskerville muzzle and go from there. Especially for a foster dog, this could be something that um, they're adoptive. The adoptive home might want to invest in something hardier. But for the foster, you might, and to start kind of desensitizing them, this will do. Okay. Um... Okay, so another question, uh, ideas on prong colors. So one of the things, so yeah, let's talk about other tools that are out there that often are recommended, um, that, well, not often are recommended, but other people use for walking. Um, I want to emphasize that I and Positive Dog Solutions and any trainer that really is read up on the science of learning they're gonna steer clear of choke collars, pinch collars, and e-collars, um, shock collars. And there are a few, a number of reasons why we stay away from these, um, these tools, and they are tools. Um, one, and I think probably the most important reason is, 
they are very difficult to use correctly. So for me to hand you a collar, a choke collar, a pinch collar, and for you to use that on your dog, that is not something that most any dog owner is gonna be able to use appropriately. The reason for that is these collars really are meant to be used in the moment to create pain, right? A pain sensation when the dog some, does something wrong. And then when the dog stops, that pain releases. Um, that is timing wise, very hard to do. Um, and so that's one thing to consider is most people don't use these collars correctly. And another thing to consider with these collars is um, because we are, instead of rewarding for good decisions, we are punishing for poor decisions. We are not teaching the dog the right thing to do. And there's a real challenge with that because if I'm only telling you what you're doing wrong, but I'm not telling you what to do to make it right, then I'm missing the most important part of that learning equation. The science tells us that if you use reward-based training and reward-based training only, you will be entirely effective in teaching your dog what to do. And you're also, that dog is going to be more, inc more inclined to learn quickly, build a great relationship with you, and, ha and, and also you have the ability to start addressing any emotional underlying of that behavior. So particularly when we're talking about dogs that are shy and timid or are reactive or have some impulsivity, um, some of that stems from arousal for impulsivity. For fearful dogs or reactive dogs, it often stems from fear, right? Um, it just comes out in a different way. It's a, a dog who's shying away is fearful. A dog who's aggressing forward is also fearful. So if we are basically adding to that equation by implementing fear, or sorry, implementing pain, but we're not really trying to change that association with classical conditioning, we're not doing the dog any favors. We're not addressing that underlying emotional problem. So by doing the classical conditioning, which is starting to pair that thing that the dog is responding to with food and thereby building a positive association, we start to address that. So that's gonna be a much more powerful way to address this. Um, so I would entirely recommend, I would entirely encourage you not to use these tools because you will likely use them incorrectly and they will not be effective. And in the, in the worst case scenario is that as you're using these tools, you are gonna create more problems. Um, and the reason that you are likely to create more problems is that every time that dog gets that sensation on their neck, that pain, they could associate it with whatever is present. So if you are working on a dog, so this is actually a real example of a client that came to me. They had a young dog. They went to a trainer who told them to use a pinch collar to help the dog learn how to appropriately greet people because the dog loved people so much that he would enthusiastically jump and jump and jump and jump. So every time, sorry, it was an e-collar, not a pinch collar. So every time the dog would jump on a person, the dog would receive a shock. And what wound up happening is, sure, the dog stopped jumping on people, but the dog also started growling at people and lunging at people. Because the dog learned that when people are around, when strangers are around, this pain happens. So to me, that is the ultimate reason to stay away from these tools, because we just don't know what we're teaching the dog when we're using them. We don't know what they're associating them with. So that was a very long answer, but I think it's an important one. And I wanna, th I wanna thank you for asking that question because I think it's really important to think fully about the consequences of using the tools that we use. Um, so again, I, I, I would absolutely encourage you to focus on the yes and not worry about the no. Um, 
Okay, let me just check in because there's some conversations that are happening, which is great. I love that you guys are talking to one another. This is fantastic. Okay, so um, Kendra asked, my foster is reactive to other dogs on walks. We're working on using treats to keep his focus on me, but if the other dog passes too closely, which is unavoidable on a narrow street, he flips out, pulling, growling, and barking. Should I keep the treats, um, keep up the treats as he flips out or just pull him away and get distance first? Okay, so um, yeah, reactive dogs, especially if you're living in DC or li living in a crowded community, right, in an ideal world, we're trying to avoid. Sometimes we can't avoid. So Kendra, one thing I would recommend is if you do see, if it's on a narrow street and you see someone coming at you, towards you, if you can turn around and become the leader, if there's no one behind you, that's a great solution. And you can actually turn around using treats, right? Treat over the nose and use it to pivot, turn and walk the other way. So that's your ideal, or if there's an alleyway or a driveway or something you can duck down to just create a little bit of distance, that would be amazing. Um, if you can't do that, uh, my advice is find as much distance as you possibly can. If you can safely walk into the street, meaning there are no cars, right, you can do that. Find as much distance as you can and yes, keep up the treats playing the find it game. So find it is a game that we talked about a couple weeks ago. It is an ultimate game for everybody on this, on this uh, webinar to be very comfortable working with and introducing find it to your dog. Bingo has gone away, so I'm just gonna show you what it is without a dog. It's very simple, five, 10 treats in your hand, say the words find it, toss those treats on the ground. And you're working towards building a mechanism where you can do find it. And if you're walking this way, you say find it and you toss the treats behind you. So the dog is, oh, is, is oriented away from the dog that's now approaching. So the more you can get that orientation away from the dog approaching and get the dog's nose in the ground, get the dog working, you just keep throwing treats until the dog's passed. That would be ideal. Um, it does take a little bit of work to make sure that you're teaching the dog the cue, find it in advance of using it, because really what we want to get to is this idea and understanding that if I hear the words find it, my nose goes to the ground because there's good stuff down there for me to get. So that is what I would, um, that's what I would recommend is if you can, use treats to get, use the find it game to get him away and get him distracted. If that's not possible, sometimes we do just need to pull, right? We just need to get him away from the situation. Um, you might also ask the person approaching, like don't be shy about just saying, hey, can you stop while we walk around you? You know, and try to have that dialogue to make it easier for you and the dog as you're trying to get away. Um, I do that quite often. Um, it's, it, it can be, I think it can be really uncomfortable at first to kind of address someone and ask them to do something because if not, your dog is gonna do this. But I have found that most people, when I say, hey, can you just let us get away from you because he's not comfortable with other dogs or with people, most people are like, oh, thanks so much, absolutely, please. You know, once I make them aware, they're happy to comply. So don't be afraid to be that advocate and to make that suggestion to the person who's approaching, right? They don't know what they don't know. So it's up to you to tell them if you're willing to. Okay. Um, so I'm realizing that we, I was gonna, so there's one, um, there's one exercise that I wanted to show you guys for impulse control. And I'm actually gonna go to, um, I'm gonna do a screen share on this one because there's a really nice video that talks about um, this idea of go crazy and freeze. So go crazy and freeze is especially for dogs who are super energetic and super energetic around people and kids especially, right? Kids, kids can be really hard, they run, they're excited, dogs get excited. Um, so it, give me one second. 
Hey guys, what are you doing? Come on. Thanks, buddy. Good job. You want this? Um, so go crazy and freeze can be a really nice way to start working on impulse control in the sense of when there's activity, you can get excited, but you need to stop when I stop. You need to be able to still respond to sit, to a cue. So the idea with go crazy and freeze is, and I'll show you this video, but the idea is that you basically start and you maybe take a couple of steps, get the dog moving with you, you freeze, ask for a sit. They sit, mark, then you mark and reward. That's, that's phase one, where we really just do some like easy steady mo motions and as we're doing easy steady motions, we stop, dog sits, get to reward. And then phase two, which might happen in a few days time, it might happen in a week's time, is now our easy steady motions start like, we're gonna like move a little bit more quickly, get the dog moving a little quickly, stop, and we continue to phase three, which, which maybe then we're doing like jumping jacks, right? We're really like getting going. We stop, dog sits, mark reward. So you're starting to very slowly increase the amount of activity that you're doing around the dog and then rewarding them for, they'll get excited naturally. The reward is coming for them being able to stop immediately and sit. So really, really nice behavior, especially for younger dogs to start building. So let me see if I can find this video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so let me pause this. So I'm gonna get let YouTube do its magic and give uh, Bingo a break. Let me share my screen. Okay. Here we go. And I'll send this link around um, as well. Um, I should mention, yeah, they use cross arms to your chest to sit. They do this because most people, um, if a dog's like jumping all over them, they're gonna like naturally kind of protect their body by doing that. So you can certainly use that as the sit. This is a beginning exercise of Go Crazy Freeze, where we start teaching the dog to sit for the child with just a hand signal, which is both hands up to the chest. And we start by giving them treats and then just walking and stopping every now and then so that they learn when the child stops and brings her hands up that they should sit. Why do you have them do both hands as a signal? We do both hands because if somebody's afraid of a dog, they're probably going to bring their hands up to their chest like that if the dog runs toward them. And so this way, the dog will think that hands going up to your chest is a signal to sit and they'll be less likely to jump. So this is phase two of Go Crazy Freeze, where we start to run a little bit with the dog and stop and do the hands up again. Now you're not having her say the word sit. Is there a reason for that? Right, because if somebody's afraid, they're not gonna tell the dog to sit. They're just gonna kind of lean away and so usually kind of put their hands up. And that way, the dog learns, and the dog also learns that when the children stop, that's also a signal to sit. So this is phase three, where we try to get other family members involved. Okay, everybody freeze. 
Good. You'll give her the treat. Now, Mary, you'll come up and you'll give her a treat. Good. And then we'll tell her, okay, and we'll play again. <laughs> and freeze. Oh, she's going to go, Daddy. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. See if we can get one more. <laughs> and freeze. <laughs> Good girl. Good girl. All right. All right, guys, so um, that gives you a little bit of an idea um, of what this looks like, what this could look like um, at home. And, and if you're in a home with your foster dog and you've got kids, as you saw from this video, this is actually a really great thing to do to integrate your kids into the game. Um, you know, the one thing that I always emphasize is if you move from phase one to phase two and phase two, the behavior is breaking down, you're not getting to sit. Oops. All right, sorry, so when you're doing this, if you move from phase one to phase two and the behavior starts to break down, then you want to end the behavior. I mean, go back to the last behavior, right? So if you move from phase one to phase two, it's breaking down, go back to phase one. That's the gist of it. Okay, guys, so I'm gonna pause there. We're at 11.55, um, so I'm gonna call that uh, a day as far as the stuff that I wanted to cover and thanks again for all of your questions.